Hey guys, welcome back. So now we gotta talk about Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals Judgment Day, which is really just the Eternals versus the X-Men with the Avengers caught in the middle. But before we get into it, first I gotta take the time to talk about why the Eternals are even doing this. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so before we dive right in, first we gotta talk about what brought us to this point. And to do that, I gotta talk about how the Avengers, the Eternals, and the X-Men are involved here. And really when it comes down to it, it's about how the Avengers and the Eternals are involved in the way that this fell into the lap of the X-Men who are just minding their own business. But either way, starting with the Avengers, in the beginning of Avengers Volume 8 by Jason Aaron, we got the introduction to the Avengers 1 million BC, when at the time we had witnessed the fall of a weakened celestial to where then we fast forward to the modern day where the Avengers find hundreds of anomalies forming around Earth and with Captain Marvel being the first to respond, she then finds that these anomalies are actually portals that are just dropping out dead celestials, hundreds of them in fact, that were just falling from the sky all around the world which had then led to heroes from all over shuffling around to minimize casualties in populated areas. But also around this time you had T'Challa who had reached out to Doctor Strange to help him investigate ancient remains within a dig site which had then led them to the center of the earth where they then find millions of these green eggs that soon after start hatching with these huge bugs coming out that begin to attack them and later we come to find out that these quote unquote bugs from hell as Ghost Rider Robbie Reyes would call them are officially known as the Horde, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit along with Mephisto's connection to the Horde. But this then all escalated quickly when three dark celestials showed up which marked the arrival of the final host, who made their way here to purge the planet. And to tie this into some of our recent talks on Avengers, it was also around this time when Isan the Searcher fell next to Jennifer Walters and with him barely alive, he telepathically called for her help. He gave her a hulking gamma upgrade so she could help the Celestials fight the Horde and also be part of the cure. And I talk more about that in the She-Hulk video where I go through all of her transformations from Civil War 2 all the way up till now. And I got that link below for anyone who needs to get caught up. But not long after this, we then get the reveal that it was Loki who had led the final host to Earth. And this is where it starts to pull things together before so much more gets added on. Cause at this time Loki had explained to Captain America, letting him know that he wanted to show him the infection, while also letting Cap know that the patient is the Earth and it's time that she either healed or died. And it's here where Loki shows Cap, the celestial that had fallen 4 billion years ago, who's known as the Progenitor. Which then leads into the story of Loki telling Cap about how what the heroes thought they knew, as far as the celestials coming to Earth and experimenting on humans was just a lie. But instead it was the Progenitor who had been infected by the Horde, who had fell to Earth and died a long slow death. Death. And from its arrival from 4 billion years ago up until today, the energy that had bled from the celestial, it saturated the earth and over the years this is what caused the evolution of mutants and the dawn of heroes on this planet. And to go a step further, we later find out in Avengers issue 38 that this is something that Mephisto had witnessed as well, 4 billion years ago in the form of a fly, when he had laid the first of a billion maggots, which from there takes us into the story of how Mephisto believed that this world was to be his, but regardless of how much he tried over billions of years, the heroes or the Avengers, they would find a way somehow to make it out on top. But then after this, in the present day, we find that Iron Man and Doctor Strange have made their way to Olympia, the home of the Eternals, to get some answers but only to find the place destroyed with a number of Eternals who have killed themselves and each other as a result of going mad after seeing the truth. And it's here where Tony finds Icarus who's barely alive. And for Icarus, with his dying breath, he tells Tony that the truth tore us apart. The Eternals were great fools, we weren't here to protect you, but instead they were here to cultivate, because to them, to the space gods, you are a useful pathogen. Don't let the final host unleash the horde, only the Unimind can stop them, only you can be the cure. And it's here where Icarus gives Tony the secrets to the Unimind just before he dies. And from there, Tony then takes this information to the rest of the Avengers, and together they figure out how to stop the horde because collectively they realize that with the Horde being a disease to the Celestials and the Progenitor dying of that disease 4 billion years ago, that rather than the Celestials just destroying Earth, when the first host arrived, they allowed that disease to stay with the Progenitor because they knew that years later, this would give mankind mutants and people with superpowers who grow powerful enough years later to be able to defeat the Horde, which more or less made mankind a live virus vaccine, which is why the Celestials had the Eternals cultivate mankind all the way through to the 
the present day when they're ready to be the cure, which here and now is the Avengers. And with them figuring this out, Tony told the other heroes how the Unimind solution was the key, and it was from there where all the heroes combined their minds and their energies merged with the dead Celestial, which is what they then used to defeat the Horde. And shortly after this, the Celestials had then taken Loki, but with doing so, they had also given the Avengers a gift, which from here was the Celestials raising the Progenitor up from the depths at the North Pole, which from then to this current time has made the Progenitor the Avengers' new headquarters, otherwise known as Avengers Mountain. So where from there, there's plenty of other things going on. But for the sake of this video, this is where we cross over to the Eternals. Because at the beginning of Kieran Gillen's Eternals, we're given the rebirth of Icarus, with him being one of the last Eternals we saw die, which is what makes him here the last one to be brought back. But with the seeing him return here within the exclusion that's located below the South Pole, this then leads to Icarus finally finding out that between the time of his death and rebirth, Zerus has become the new Prime Eternal. And soon after this, we then head to New York, where Icarus and Sprite are spotted by Tony Stark. Who for Tony, with him seeing the Eternals at this point, he's kind of side-eyeing him like, you guys okay? Because the last time he had seen him over in Olympia, they were kind of killing themselves and each other. So that's why Tony's hitting Icarus with the, hey, you, you good? Because last time he seen him, he wasn't good. Matter of fact, nobody was good. It was just a pile of bodies. But of course, Icarus tells Tony that the Eternals are much better now, which is really a dry response more than anything else because the Eternals still have a lot to figure out. And that list of things to figure out then gets worse when Icarus and the others back over in Olympia find out that Zerus, the Prime Eternal, has been murdered by someone who's crushed Zerus' head with their bare hand which had then led us to discovering that not only was this done by Thanos, but also that he was getting inside help from Festos, who had retrieved the body of Thanos before it went into the black hole back in Guardians of the Galaxy, to where then he made a deal with Thanos, telling him that he's the weapon that he needs. Because with Festos discovering that Thanos is a true Eternal, which goes back to our talks on Thanos Rises, back when I talked about how the Eternals had made Thanos, but for Festos, with him discovering that Thanos is a true Eternal, Festos then tells him that if he helps him, then he will make sure that Thanos is fully integrated into the machine, which at this point Thanos isn't because Thanos is an Eternal that was born Deviant. And trust me, that part makes a lot more sense after reading Thanos Rises. But in addition to them making this deal, Festos had planted a contingency within Thanos just in case Thanos betrayed him. And of course, Thanos was aware of this contingency, but he accepted the deal anyway because he saw it as a challenge for him to later turn the tables in his favor somewhere along the line. But the revelation of what Festos was up to was then revealed to the others in issue 6 because when he was the first Eternal to come back, he was alone with the machine and it was then when he discovered the cost of their immortality, which for the Eternals meant that every time that they were brought back after death, that this would come at the cost of the life of one human. So again, not only were the Eternals not protecting the humans, but they were also killing them at the same time. And his hero Festos tells them how the Eternals no longer have a purpose. The world's protected by a grand array of heroes, which we'll find later that in some cases, these heroes are considered to be the new gods versus the Eternals who are now like the old gods. But for Festos, he tried destroying the machine to end this, but destroying the machine also meant destroying the world, which leaves the Eternals just trapped in this loop. But it was at this time where Festos, he had pretty much told them everything about Thanos, as well as Festos nearly destroying the machine. And after this, they took the information to Zerus, the Prime Eternal, who had been resurrected at this point. But more importantly than them just finding that Festos was behind this, they were all more concerned about the resurrection killing humans part. And Zerus let them know that there's probably something they could do, but they have to discuss this within the Unimind so that all the Eternals can have a say. But come to find out, the Eternals as a whole, they didn't care because many of the humans would be dead in a number of decades anyway. And this left Icarus and the others desperate for change, which is what sent them to Lemuria to get answers from the Deviants, who are able to change unlike them. But after not getting answers directly from the Deviants, this then later led them to get answers from the Progenitor. And to do so, rather than just asking the Avengers, they broke into Avengers Mountain, which is something that only added to Iron Man and the Avengers not trusting the Eternals. And through the course of this, we discover that Druig is working with Thanos as an advisor, and it's really one of those things where Druig is like, Thanos, why didn't you come to me early? You know I stay scheming. <laughs> and on the flip side, Thanos is like, well, I've had a Mephisto in my ear before, and you're not quite Mephisto. But even still, in the background throughout this series, they end up working together, with Thanos knowing that he's being played either by Festos or Druid the whole time. And from there, they form their untrusting alliance. 
and at this point his suggestion to give Thanos what he wanted, it was simply for Druid to rig the election for Prime Eternal so that once Zerus was gone, again, Thanos would easily take his place. Because with Thanos as the new Eternal Prime, he would have more access and a better chance at getting what he wants. And so of course this led to Thanos killing Zerus again. But this time around with doing so, Thanos had become Eternal Prime with the help of Druig. But fast forward towards the conclusion, Druig had helped Thanos capture Festos, to where then Thanos tortured Festos in an attempt to force him into fully integrating Thanos with the machine. But as it turns out, Festos didn't really know how, and he had no plans of doing so after using Thanos to stop the Eternals from killing the humans, because at this point he had only given Thanos partial integration. So Festos suggested that Thanos just ask his parents, but when he asked them, they didn't cooperate. And for Thanos, this brings him to the point of failing after multiple attempts of trying to fully integrate integrate with the machine, to where then Thanos is just like, you know what, how about I just activate the Doomsday failsafe and just destroy the world, cause why not? But as for the other Eternals who have made their way to Lemuria, the home of the Deviants, who have now made their way to Avengers Mountain, a number of them run a distraction to keep the Avengers busy while Ajax communicates with the ghost of the dead Celestial in order to get the secrets of the Deviants. And with her doing this, the Celestial ghost, he wasn't trying to talk to her at all and mainly because the Celestials, they like the Avengers now and not the Eternals. So for Ajax to actually get this information on the Deviants, she had to beat it out of this guy. But with her taking this method, it's effective. She gets the full schematic scriptures for the Deviants, their design goals, everything. And she also discovers that the Deviants are the important ones. But with Ajax getting the information, Cersei then tells the Avengers that Thanos is on Earth and he's seconds away from destroying it, which from there allows these guys to go after Thanos and pretty much get beat up for a while. But when Thanos initiates the Doomsday failsafe, it's here where the contingency of Festos kicks in. Because when Festos brought Thanos back, he had more or less put a kill switch in Thanos in case Thanos betrayed him. But also Festos had made sure that in the event that something happened to where he couldn't activate himself or if he was killed and that memory was lost on how to activate it, Festos made sure that his felt safe would activate if Thanos ever triggered a world ending event. And with the way that this was done away from the others, it made it seem as if Druid could save the day. And so of course with Druid being Druid, he takes the credit. And it's from here where Druid then becomes the Prime Eternal. And from here, when Cersei fills in Tony and the others about the whole Thanos situation, which includes the fact that Thanos was the prime eternal at one point, which kind of made him ruler of the planet, and this just makes Tony and the Avengers trust the Eternals even less. And even at this point, Cersei hasn't told them everything. But after this, we then go to Olympia with Druid, who's enjoying his new position on the throne. But he also believes that with himself being the Prime Eternal, that he has to find a way to give his people purpose. And to do so, he has the machine search for Deviants. But now with the updated information that Ajax had got from Avengers Mountain, this search first brings up Lemuria, the home of the Deviants. But then next to it, another spot lights up. And this location is Krakoa. And with seeing this, Druid also discovers that not only is this the capital for mutants, but also that these mutants have recently expanded to the planet Mars, or better yet the planet formerly known as Mars, which is planet Arako now. But with Druid discovering this, it's here where he initially sees the expansion of mutants on Mars as excess deviation. But on top of this, we get a bit more information in the 2022 Free Comic Book Day Judgment Day issue, when we get a flashback just shy of a million years ago. And it's here where we find Druid with Odin, the leader of the Avengers 1 million BC, as well as Duranos. And it's at this time, shortly after the prehistoric Avengers had came together, when Druid had invited Odin out here to show him these monkeys that had developed telepathy and telekinesis that he had seen as excess deviation. But Druig had just called Odin out here to let Odin know that this whole species was going to be exterminated because of their excess deviation. And Odin just allowed this to happen. And with doing so, Odin said that it's not worth going to war over a few little monkeys. But now fast forward to current day with Druig now being the prime eternal and the latest version of excess deviation that he's now discovered is the mutants of Krakoa who initially caught his attention when the machine pulled them up, as well as the civilization on planet Arako. But one of the first moves that Druid makes is sending in Jack of Knives to investigate, to where then Jack of Knives discovers that the mutants have figured out immortality. And with Jack of Knives reporting back to Druid, he lets him know that the mutants and death aren't a thing anymore, they're eternal. And when Jack of Knives asks what is the plan as far as what's their next course of action, Druid lets Jack know that it depends on if this striking mutation is a deviation. And from there, Jack replies, well, if it is. And Druid is just like, Jack, let's be honest, nothing we haven't done before. 
So in other words, Druid just wants to do the mutants just like the monkeys. <laughs> so from here, I'm gonna refrain from going on a rant and we'll just pick back up with Judgment Day Part 1. All right, so the way that this starts off, we begin with Tony and Cersei, who are having a meeting because Tony, he's got some questions. And keep in mind that this meeting is right next to the Krakoan tree house in New York, like right next to it. But also on the surface, this may seem like a bit of a date since Tony has expressed his attraction to Cersei before and his shirt is unbuttoned, so you know the vibes. But instead, this is set up to be quite similar to their lunch date in Karen Gillan's Internals Issue 5, when at the time Cersei used Tony as bait and shut down his nervous system in order to get the forgotten one to show up, to where then she gave Icarus the signal to swoop in and get the guy. So kind of keep this in mind as well as we start this off. Because it's here where Tony's like, hey, let's just cut to the chase. Why are we going to be fighting in the next day or two? To where then Cersei, she switches it up, saying how she'd be much more likely to pick a fight with the mutants since they copied the Eternals whole flow, with them now using immortality. And it's here as soon as Tony says that she's not going to make this easy, to where then she admits that she isn't, and right then she's just swooped up by the Phoenix. Cause that's how karma works. But it's here that we quickly find out that this was all just a setup for the Avengers to bring Cersei in for interrogation. And for good measure, they brought in Thor, Captain Marvel, and the Phoenix to do so. But back on the ground right next to where this had happened, we then jump over to the treehouse where Cyclops is looking like, what they doing over there? <laughs> but with him seeing the Phoenix, he expresses how it feels odd to see the Phoenix as an Avenger. But if we're being honest, the Phoenix has been odd since Avengers vs X-Men. But even still, I get what he's saying as far as the Phoenix being an actual Avenger. But with Scott mentioning this to Jean, she didn't much notice it because she was distracted by the protesters below. Because with the word being out that mutants have immortality, this has caused a lot of humans to go into uproar. And sure, you got some humans who never liked mutants anyway, so of course they don't want mutants to live forever. But then you have some who are just heartbroken because it's exclusive, like one woman who lost her daughter, and because her daughter wasn't a mutant, she'll never get her back. And that's just the way it is for normal people. And with Jean bringing this to Scott's attention. His response is very practical because the five can't bring back everyone even if the mutants wanted them to. But on top of that it's not as if anyone has done anything about mutants being killed which was the primary problem before they discovered immortality. But after this we then jump to Krakoa which at this point has a population of 200,000 and it's here where we find Destiny telling the others that there will be a war. And initially she's not sure as far as who it's coming from even though she knows it's not Orcus but they are ready. And soon after this, Destiny discovers that it's the Eternals. The Eternals are going to try to kill them all. So right away, Mystique and Destiny, they go to warn the Quiet Council, while Nightcrawler heads to planet Araco to warn Storm, Magneto, and the others. But with Nightcrawler heading to Araco, the planet formerly known as Mars, which at this point has a population of 1 million. But before we go any further, we gotta take a step back and talk about this for a second. Because during Planet Size X-Men, Issue 1, when Storm, Magneto, Iceman, and a few others came together to terraform the planet, they had then used the external gate to bring the island Araco from Earth to Mars. And within the galactic political stage, Planet Araco was soon after made the capital of the Soul System. And of course, with this happening, Doctor Doom shows up, questioning all of this, asking who rules this new planet, who's the king of Mars, who speaks for Soul, and immediately after he got the answer to all that and it was storm storm and storm or hardari yao which is storm <laughs> which was a rather satisfying moment but with nightcrawler coming to Araco to inform them on the war coming with the eternals he lets them know that the quiet council is getting ready to meet and the great ring on Araco, which is like their version of the quiet council they need to be informed as well to where from there, Magneto says a storm will give Araco's perspective to Krakoa, while Kurt and himself take the issue to the Great Ring. But then it's from here where we jump over to Avengers Mountain, where we find that Tony has brought Cersei to a psychic dead room so that he can interrogate her without her messing with his mind again or calling for help. But with him doing this, Cersei wastes no time reminding Tony that she's a minor psychic and a world class matter manipulator. So if she wanted to kill Tony, she could do it in the blink of an eye. And of course, with trust between the Avengers and the Eternals being the issue here, Tony quickly lets her know like, yeah, with her saying that, it, it doesn't help. But Cersei, she's just like, okay, just get on with it. Show me a little PowerPoint and hopefully this will convince me to help you out. And <laughs> right there, Tony's like, well, it, it's not a PowerPoint, okay? It's my own bespoke system that uses AI-generated fades to, you know what, forget it. Last month, you Eternals snuck into Avengers Mountain. How about we start there? <laughs> like you could tell that hurt just a little bit. 
but Tony brings up how the Eternals snuck into Avengers Mountain to do some cosmic stuff and Tony expresses that he understands the idea of a hero doing something sketchy and saying, hey, this needed to be done. And for the Eternals, it wasn't until their plan went sideways where they came out and told the truth. As far as Thanos being on Earth and leading the Eternals, as well as the Earth being minutes away from destruction as a result, and she says she regrets that as if it were just some mistake. And she tells Tony that there are some things that only the Eternals can know, which then has Tony like, oh, y'all just hiding another doomsday, huh? And she tries to flip this around by telling Tony that he should tell her what he knows. So from there, she can determine what she wants to share to help them out. And it's right there with hearing this that Captain America's like, okay, this isn't working, and he steps in. And when this happens, Iron Man, of course, warns Cap that he's not protected in here because Cersei's an untrustworthy, psychopathic, telepathic telepath. <laughs> Stick to the plan. And I mean, he didn't say it like that, but he's telling Cap, he's warning him that he's not protected in here. But Cap tells Tony that Cersei was once an Avenger, so they have to show her trust. And when Cap tells her that the Eternals are going to war, tell us what you know, she initially jokes about it. But when she sees the seriousness in Cap's face, she then realizes that Druig had done something. And it's here where Tony lets her know that ever since he had found out that they were hiding Thanos, he had taken data from the recent confrontation after the Eternals had snuck in to track for anything that felt eternally. And this brought to his attention just a week ago, a huge spike in the Pacific Ocean that cut out instantly, as if someone was testing something. And of course, Cersei points out that a lot of people use celestial energies, so it doesn't necessarily mean war. And she goes on to let Cap and Tony know that whatever it is, she's not a part of it because the Eternals aren't like an entire team. They're a society and a society that her and her friends had left, which in reference, this points back to them discovering about their immortality and a handful of them going to the Deviants in Lemuria to try to find a way to change since Eternals can't change on their own. But again, Cersei doesn't give them all those details because she's all about the minimum coverage right now. And all she really tells them is that she's not the Eternal that they need to be worried about. And it's from here where we then jump back one hour over to Olympia where we find Druig seeking the approval of the Unimine to correct the excess deviation that is mutants. And he makes the case that they've missed this deviation before. But with their X gene coming from deviants, this makes mutants and deviants the same. And at this point, they've deviated by leaving the Earth, which is the great machine, and colonizing on Mars, as well as escaping the chains of death, which means that their excess deviation will go on forever. And this leads to the prime eternal Druig getting a unanimous approval from the Unimine. But it's also from here where I wanna get into what we'd seen in the Eve of Judgment Day, issue one, because it's here where we see Druig's first attempt with him going to Domo, who's constructed an antimatter bomb, which they attempt to use to destroy Kokoa. But because their second principle is to protect the machine, and the machine is essentially the Earth, and Krakoa falls into the lines of being part of the Earth, this then backfires on them because destroying Krakoa breaks the second principle, which also in a way makes Krakoa a part of the machine, which is rather interesting. But then for Druig, after experiencing this failure, while he's here in the exclusion, this then causes him to realize that if he wants to commit genocide, that he needs to go to the Eternal that does it best, who's also the first Eternal to be locked away in the exclusion, Uranos, the grand uncle of Thanos, or better yet, grandfather, cause Thanos, you know, he switched it up too. So it's grandfather now, but Druid makes Uranos a deal, giving him one hour to go on a killing spree. And Uranos is confident that that is more than enough time for him to do some damage. Because in the same way it takes nine months to make a human who can be killed in seconds, he's gonna take that principle and his wrath to the planet Arako, which was made in a day, and he's gonna make use of that one hour. And Druig is rather tight on the time restriction because he's made sure that the machine is programmed to bring Uranos back in precisely one hour. And then after this, we then head over to a meeting between Druig and Mora McTaggart, who at this point in time, Mora, she's with Orcus. And this really just stems from what we'd seen where Mystique had the whole get Destiny back or burn this place to the ground thing going. To where then later, Destiny came back, which shouldn't have been possible because Mora requested for Destiny's DNA and backups to be destroyed. But with Mystique posing as Charles, she later used the five to bring back Destiny. And during Inferno, while Mystique was doing this, she had Hope complete the process since the real Charles wasn't actually there. But nonetheless, with Destiny actually coming back and then getting voted on the Quiet Council, this of course pissed off Mora in addition to the fact that Magneto refused to kill Destiny. And when this happened, this is where Mora took a turn because the same way that Mystique had felt like she wanted to burn everything to the ground if Destiny can't come back, 
And now Moira, she wants to burn everything to the ground because Destiny did come back. And that's pretty much the long and short of it, because Moira feels like she gave the mutants everything and they cast her out. But also at this current time, Moira, she's with Orcus and she lets Druid know that Orcus is on the same side, pro-human, anti-mutant. And in this conversation, anti-mutant or anti-deviant, it's potato potato. And really from here, Moira, she just gives Druid the inside scoop on Krakoa and the mutants infrastructure. And with this happening, the next thing we see as soon as we jump over to the Quiet Council, who at this point are figuring out what they're going to do as far as this upcoming war with the Eternals. And before you know it, boom, they're hit with a psychic attack from the Unimind, which is just nuts. Because to the naked eye, this doesn't look like anything. But to the telepaths on the Quiet Council, it just got real. But also with this seeing this attack, it provokes the idea of what could be an indirect attack on the island of Krakoa, since the island passively feeds off of a harmless amount of telepathic energy. But nonetheless, with this happening while Juig is explaining this to Moira, he lets her know that this is being done to keep the leaders distracted and create confusion. But then Moira lets Druig know that the telepaths are not all of Krakoa, and that he's gonna need to do a bit more. And it's here where he tells her that he's deployed his stealth resources, equipped with armor from their earliest days, to attack the mutants on the island. And with this happening, the mutants from New York, they make their way from the treehouse down to Krakoa to help out. And Druig mentions that he didn't bother to destroy any of the other doors to try to keep the others from coming, because then they would've lost the element of surprise, and magic, she would've gotten them there anyway. But while this is going on, we then go to Arako at the Great Ring while they're having their meeting. And out of nowhere, you just see this bright light. And a second later, Nightcrawler's bamfing, telling everyone to get out. Meanwhile, back in Krakoa, Wolverine is the first one to sniff out what's actually going on. Because while the other mutants outside are being attacked from above, someone else is inside picking off the members of the five, only to then head next for the Quiet Council. And many of whom who are frozen and defenseless because they're fighting off the attack of the Unimine. But Wolverine discovers that it's Jack of Knives that has snuck down here and already killed Egg, a member of the Five, because Wolverine smelled Egg's blood on Jack's knife. Because otherwise, Wolverine wouldn't pick this up, much like how Jack snuck in the first time and found out about the resurrection to begin with. And we find that Wolverine, he gets in here just in time to save Hope. But shortly after this, in what seems to be a failed assassination attempt, all these guys then retreat, and then from here we go over to Arbor Magna to where fortunately Egg has made a few more eggs so that he could be resurrected and shortly after they start bringing back the others as well. But while they're here, Kurt then drops in and it's here where he gets them caught up on what happened on Arako. And all we see from here is just the wake of destruction with Uranos counting down from his one hour, getting ready to make his way back to the exclusion. And as far as what we're shown with what's left of Arako, this place is just a graveyard with nothing left but bones, dust, and smoke. And with seeing this, it's here we follow Uranos back to the exclusion, where we find Druig waiting for him, just talking like, hey, how's the trip? But when Uranos gets here and he hears Druig say, at least I could count on you. And right away, this lets him know that Druig's other plan had failed. And Uranus is kind of like, man, just let me out. You know, I'll handle everything. But Druig knows better and he's like, you know, it hasn't gotten that bad just yet. But just off of Druig expressing this alone, it lets Uranus know that he's going to be let out again at some point. But just after this, Tony sees that there's an attack on Kokoa, as well as an alert for those energy spikes that he saw before, which is then followed by a message that goes out to everyone's electronic device in the world. And it's here where we find that it's Druig broadcasting to all the humans, and he tells them that he's doing this through their devices because he wouldn't use telepathy like a mutant would. Ew. But he sends out this message to let all the humans know that the mutants are a threat and the Eternals are going to handle it. So where then he tells them, oh, by the way, don't be alarmed by these towering death machines. They're called the Hex and they are also Eternals. And he lets the humans know that be assured, whether large or small, the Eternals are their protectors. And from here, when we go back to Avengers Mountain, it's here where Cap fills the others in. As far as Cersei telling him and Tony that her and her friends have left the Eternals, but she didn't say why. And at a moment's notice, they then get another eternal alert to where right away Tony goes to check it out and come to find out it's Ajax and Makari, along with the kidnapped Mr. Sinister, who they had commandeered around the time when they discovered that their plan was possible. And she explains her plan to Tony by telling him that this is a holy war born of holy scripture. A god can rewrite the scripture and end the war. So all they have to do is simply build a god. And with hearing this, Tony's pretty much like, yeah, that's ridiculous, but keep going. And he's curious to know with everything going on right now, how are they going to make a god in a few hours? And it's right here where Ajax tells them that they have everything that they need because they're pretty much standing inside of one. 
so you already know from here that it's about to go down. Alright, so for this one, we jump right back in from what we had seen in Judgment Day Part 1, when Druig had released the Hex during his broadcast to the people of Earth when he told the world that mutants were a threat, so the Hex, who are Eternals, they're gonna handle it. But also keep in mind, through the course of that message, Druig, he was very political, with his approach of using devices instead of telepathy, as well as his message of telling the people of Earth, do not fear the Hex, and these six are not towering death machines, they're one of us, they're here to help which immediately caused celebration from a number of the humans and we know because we saw the reaction of the protesters who were just overjoyed that the Eternals were here to save the day. And it's like for me, I understand that this story is going to have a number of things that are a stretch of the imagination. But when I seen the reaction of this crowd with just overwhelming joy in response to an Eternals announcement and it had me thinking like are these people really excited about the Eternals? or are they hoping that a lot of mutants are gonna die? But then after this, we then jump over to six different civilians, who on the surface, they seem random, but they're very important within the scope of this story. And as we visit each one, we visit them during the time of Druig's announcement. And with doing so, we get a bit of their take or more or less their reaction in the moment that it was announced. And for the first one, we got a guy named Tom who's just brushing his teeth, getting ready for bed while wearing a brew two shirt. And just as a bit of a side thought, I'm not sure if the shirt is a reference to the comic book character within the comics or if it's a reference to Howard Lindley who was a scientist back in Tales of Suspense issue 22, who had been thinking of the comic book character when he was struck by an atomic ray that had blended his thoughts into reality, which transformed him into the character Brutu. And it's a good thing that the song Body Crazy Curvy Wavy wasn't out at the time, because Howard might have seen some different results. But either way, back to the civilians. From left to right, we start with Tom, and when he hears the announcement, he's like, good for the Eternals. Someone needed to do something, and from there he just goes to bed. And then next, we have Katrina in Vancouver, to where for her, when she hears this, she's on the side of the mutants. So she sends out a ton of tweets, and she gets quite a bit of a positive reaction, because a number of other people are retweeting what she's saying, and deep down, she wishes that these retweets could be a shield over Krakoa, even though she knows realistically that they won't. And then thirdly, we go to Mumbai, where we find Arjun who over the course of his life, he's been through a lot and he's survived a lot. And with him hearing about the announcement and the hex, he just thinks to himself, the heroes will save us, they always do. And then after him, we go to Daniela in Sao Paulo, to where for her, she's been very optimistic because just yesterday, she was thinking of how nice it would be to be a mutant and how great it would be with free everything, beaches, immortality. But after hearing the announcement from Druig, she then starts to think, well, okay, at least the internals informed us humans. And for the fifth civilian, we go to Jada in New York who we had seen in issue one with her being among the protesters because she lost her daughter and she didn't think it was fair that the mutants only had immortality while the rest of the world just had to suffer loss. But with her hearing Druig's message, she does not agree that genocide is the answer. And then last but not least, we then go to Yokohama, Japan, where we find Kenta, to where for him, his parents are concerned about the tidal waves that have been created because of the Hex, but for him, he just doesn't care. But then later he changes his gamer tag to Hex Blaster in his favorite shooter and shortly after that he gets banned. <laughs> Which is crazy because everyone he knows and loves could possibly get wiped out by a tidal wave and it's at this time that he gets kicked off the game. And it's like man, can he get a little XP before he's X'd out? Like give the kid a break. But then after this we then go over to Exodus and the other mutants at Krakoa. But as we do, keep in mind those six civilians because they are a significant part to this story. And it's here where we jump in where we actually pick up from Immortal X X-Men issue 5, which is an issue that takes place during Judgment Day issue 1, when we had seen Druid use the Unimind to attack the Quiet Council in an attempt to distract them, assassinate the Five, and destroy Arbor Magna. But through the course of this issue, with it starting just before the attack, within that meeting of the Quiet Council, with the council members discussing their awareness of the abduction of Mr. Sinister, even though they weren't sure at the time if this was a kidnapping or an abduction, with it happening in relation to the destruction of a small town called Little Hollow, that had taken place in Eternals issue 11, which at the time was shortly after Thanos had become the Prime Eternal. But at this point, with the Quiet Council not having all the information and really just piecing things together, throughout the course of this meeting and also during the attack, from the Unimine, we get a number of moments where Exodus has a series of flashbacks, which was super cool to see because Exodus has been around for centuries. 
And I mean, Apocalypse did put Exodus to sleep for the better part of a thousand years, but even still, Exodus has seen quite a bit in his time. But throughout the course of this, with us following Exodus through these flashbacks, all the way through to medieval France and him fighting in the Crusades, to where he had later then met Apocalypse, who had then enhanced his powers, only for him later to then turn on Apocalypse. But through the course of this, we're taking on a quick rundown journey through his life, where we see him as a crusader, as a herald, as an acolyte. But regardless of these many changes and who we'd seen him become over the years, we're shown how every time he made his decision, he had thought it through and he made it align with his faith. And with how this is done, it shows us that this method of reasoning, it's always followed Exodus all the way through to today, to the moment where Druid released the Hex to annihilate the mutants in Krakoa. And for Exodus, the way that he sees this, the Eternals, there are dragons that he has to slay. Because now in this new world that the mutants have established, he's the Pope of a new church, but he's also a knight and a dragon slayer at that. So initially when he goes into this fight yelling on guard, <laughs> it sounds like I'm saying on God. But when Exodus goes for one of the members of the Hex, who I believe goes by the name of Sign, S-Y-N-E, but with Exodus going towards this huge thing, he knocks it off of the island with one shot. <laughs> on God. And from here, Jean telepathically reaches out to Scott and she's like, okay, Exodus got one. How are you guys doing? And Scott's like, man, not gonna lie, we need some help. But then Captain America's shield comes flying through and shortly after, they're met by the arrival of the Avengers. And initially, Exodus, he doesn't want the Avengers' help because they're not mutants and this isn't their fight. But with Magic being here and also being one of the great captains of Kokoa, it's really her call whether the Avengers can join or not. And the way she sees it, the more the merrier. And if Exodus has an issue with that, he can just schedule a meeting with the Quiet Council. But nonetheless, Captain America and the rest of the Avengers are happy to join because him and the others know that it'll be good for the world to see them working together. And so after this, we then head over to Avengers Mountain with Tony, Ajak, and Makari along with the kidnapped Mr. Sinister. And at this point, they're still putting their heads together on how to make a god. And Tony can't help but admit that Reed Richards is gonna be green with envy when he finds out that Tony had something to do with this. But from here on Krakoa, Captain America and Cyclops get things organized with Captain America asking like, okay, how can we help? And Cyclops tells Cap that many of the mutants on Krakoa, they're non-combatant and a lot of them are just mutants. And for that reason, they want to get them to the defensive walls. And when saying this, Cyclops tells Cap to handle the Hex and get people to safety, while him and the others protect Resurrection. And his hero Cap tells Cyclops that he's on it, no problem. But after everything they've been through, he wishes that Cyclops could have told them more, instead of keeping secrets. And with Cap saying this, this is also a reference to a more recent conversation between the two of them, when Cap had questions about Krakoa and their suspicious jump in numbers, but Scott was very short with them. And it's like now with Cap saying that I wish you would have told us more before or after everything we've been through and Cyclops responds like after everything how could we and it's like man like when Cyclops said that Captain, he couldn't say nothing. There was no response to that. But also with this fight continuing and just amplifying the earthquakes and waves that the Hex were already causing, this had then sent huge waves over towards the Philippines, while also creating tsunamis that are heading towards the east coast of USA, Australia, and Japan. And with Jean seeing this, she tells Scott and Scott tells Cap to go deal with the fallout. So overall, that'll be one less thing that they have to worry about. And just before Cap goes, he tells Scott thank you and that the world will know that these guys are heroes. But as the Avengers go to deal with that. Exodus sees all these guys leaving and he sends a telepathic message just to the council like look these guys are abandoning us and this is more or less a reminder of who they really are and for some of these guys with seeing this they're not getting the whole story and it's here where Destiny tells Nightcrawler that what they're seeing is to be expected because she sees the future and she remembers the past and in either case mutants have always stood alone but then it's from here where we jump back to the construction of the new god where we find Tony harvesting from the thumbprint of Erish and the Judge we see Sinister go back to what I believe was San Francisco in Uncanny X-Men Volume 2 when he hacked the head of a dreaming celestial and he returns to the site to dig for remains and find the shattered fragment of the heart of a dream. But then we find Makari harvesting pieces of the Asgardian Destroyer, which long ago was created by Odin to combat the Celestials. And on top of that, we then have Cersei, who's made her way to the other Eternals who stand against Druid, to where for them, they've made their way to Lemuria, the city of the Deviants, who's hands down seen more Celestial wrath than anyone else. But with them going there, they performed a seance in order to get a number of testimonies from the Deviants that have been slaughtered because this is needed for the heart of the God that they're putting together. Because also the reasoning behind doing this, aside from the obvious which is stopping the Eternals, it's also for them to create a better god. And while this is unfolding through the course of this, we get much of this narration from that particular god, so there's a bit of a teaser there. But also we're told more or less to keep in mind 
that with all these people coming together and making this new god, they're essentially making this god in their own image. And with knowing this, it really lets us know ahead of time that this is a dangerous combination. And I don't, and I'm not just saying that just because of Mr. Sinister, but probably more so for Tony Stark, because they're using his body as a blueprint for the nervous system of this new god. And I mean, the look on his face is just like, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> wait till Reed sees this. And they made the choice of Tony because previously he's piloted a dead celestial, he was recently possessed by the power cosmic, and his body still remembers all this. But even still, I'm sure there's a few other things his body remembers too. But through the course of this god forming, it also says, if I have a father, it is Tony Stark. But then it's from here where we then go back into the battle and we find Exodus going full speed into Sign, the member of the Hex that we'd seen him hit before, because not only had he weakened her armor, but him and Jean had also figured out with their telepathy that all of the members of the Hex are sisters, and one of the members is trying to heal Sign. so right away, Exodus is just like, oh, if it can be healed, then it can be killed. And he just flies right into the neck of Sign. And with Exodus being just stupid powerful, he's an omega level mutant with telepathy, telekinesis, telekinetic concussive blast, electromagnetic blast, and he just flies into this thing and he sets it off. And seconds before he detonates, he hears the voice of Sign saying, please don't. But Exodus is like, bump that. And he detonates, destroying the two of them. And initially the mutants celebrate because they know Exodus will be right back. But inside of the machine, Sign is being resurrected as well. But what is happening, unlike Exodus, who's having his memories restored from a backup, with him coming back, he's not going to remember the last final moments before he had died. But for Sign, with her being an eternal, she comes back remembering everything. But also at this moment, we then go back to the six civilians, where we find Tom, who's like, this is all the mutant's fault, we'll show them. And Katrina, she's still tweeting and trying to help by sending out tweets and raising awareness, though I'm sure the whole world's kind of aware at this point. But then in the case of Arjun, in his case, we then find that he is dead because once again, the Eternals have that dark secret because every time an Eternals resurrected, it costs a human life. And this time to bring back Sign, it costs the life of Arjun. And as we go to the others, we find Daniela, who at this point is working her third job because even with this battle that's shaking the world, she still got bills to pay. <laughs> Man, I felt that one. But then next we have Jada, who again does not want to see more death. And when she sees more people heading to the protest with freshly painted signs, she still doesn't know exactly what she wants, but she knows that this isn't it. And then for the last one, we then go back to Kenta who again has been banned from his favorite online game. So he's just leaning out the window, taking blurry pictures of Captain Marvel punching waves. But for Kenta, he's just a kid. He's not thinking of life or death. He's just living. But at this point, we find that the X-Men have infiltrated the Eternal Armories and cut the Hex's power supplies in an attempt to stop them. But with doing so, Phoebe, which is the big green one, who's also a team healer, for those who play Overwatch, her fauna has been interrupting the Krakoan gates, making them no longer operational. And as if this wasn't enough, another hex gate opens and Sign re-enters the lobby. And when Sign touches down, like the look on everyone's faces, they're just like, we're done. Because when Sign comes back, she's just destroying Kakoa faster than they can evacuate. So by all means, this is a terrifying moment because not only are they watching death like on its way in seconds, but also in moments, the destruction of their hope of resurrection. But with this happening in the rest of the mutants, knowing that there's nothing else that they can do in this moment, Nightcrawler just grabs Destiny and he just prays. And when he does, a god answers. And when it rises, it immediately tells the Hex to cease. And when doing so, the Hex, they cease and they get the Hex out of there. And the reason why this works, again, is because of the plan of Ajak and Makari. Because when the Celestials originally made the Eternals, the Celestials set the terms, they made the laws. So now with them creating a new god, a new Celestial, who's technically refurbished, but you know what I'm trying to say. But with this new god, they can now make changes that they otherwise could not have before. And so with everyone seeing this work and seeing the Hex leave, they start to celebrate again. But then the Celestial's like, nah, shut the hell up. And he tells them, people of Earth, listen. You are bickering children. This planet is ruined. You have attacked with unrelenting unkindness towards one another. You leave me no option. This is your judgment day. You have 24 hours to justify yourselves. You will be judged individually. You will be judged as a collective. If there is more that is just than wicked, you will live. But if you are found lacking, there will be no tomorrow. And with saying this, he holds up the thumbprint of Irishim. And when time's up, the world's either gonna get a thumbs up or a thumbs down.
Alright, so for this one we jump right back in, coming from our talk on Death to the Mutants Part 1, where we had seen Icarus and the other Eternals do their part in rebuilding the Progenitor to then later take the fight to the exclusion in order to temporarily cut off Druig's access to the Armory of Uranos, which is also a plan that we're shown more about in Jerry Dugan's X-Men issue 13, where we see Icarus communicate to Jean what needed to be done to stop the Hex, because if the mutants kill them, they'll only return, which is what set up Icarus and the others working with the X-Men to ensure that the attacks from the Hex wouldn't continue. But even with us seeing this take place and us getting the side mission within a side mission, <laughs> more or less, we know that this didn't really matter once the progenitor came online. But nonetheless, with this happening, with us seeing Icarus and the others help the X-Men by attacking the exclusion and clearing a path for them so that they could disrupt the energy flow that was being fed to the Hex as a solution to combat them on the back end, though this didn't effectively solve the problem, it still plays its role in the bigger picture as we see things play out. Because the intentions of Icarus and his faction of Eternal is being shown to the mutants, and we'll see that it was important that that was proven later on. But at this point, when we head back to the North Pole, just after the progenitor's announcement of giving the world 24 hours before they're judged, to where before that time expires, people will be judged individually. And it's here where we jump in where we find Ajak expressing to Makari that this could be a test, but nonetheless, it's extremely unjust to judge everyone individually and then have the total tally determine the world's fate. And Makari lets Ajak know that this is very much the situation. It's not just possible but this is what it is and right then Ajax is like you know we shouldn't have used a failing human as an element which obviously is them talking about Tony who hears Ajax saying this and he's more or less like you ain't gonna put this on me because he just knew Ajax was talking about him and from Tony's perspective no one else has the right to blame him for this except for himself but Cap's more optimistic about this and he lets the others know that they can't waste time pointing fingers because together they created this problem and now it's up to them to fix it but from this point moving forward the 24 hours of individual judgment it starts quickly and when it does the progenitor starts with Captain America who right off the bat gets a thumbs down but with the progenitor choosing to judge Captain America first he does this because Captain America is the symbol of inspiration for his country which is also the country that is the world leader but for Captain America in his mission to inspire it has not made the world a better place so effectively in the eyes of the progenitor Captain America is a failure and when this happens, there's a couple things that sink in real quick. Because for one, the progenitor's not wrong. Because I mean, Captain America, he's done plenty of good in his time. He contributed in a huge way to World War II. And he's inspired a number of soldiers and heroes along the way. People like Miles Morales, Weapon H, The Punisher. And I mean, okay, The Punisher, that's, that's not helping. But overall, Captain America, he has not made the world a better place. And once again, he has contributed, but in the grand scope, the world has been getting worse and Captain America has not been stopping that. And to be fair, how could he? But the progenitor, he's not here to be fair. He's here to judge and Cap got the thumbs down. <laughs> and so with Tony seeing this, he's just like, man, ain't no hope for the rest of us. But from here, Cap's not giving up and he's still leaning towards the option of finding a way out of this. So he tells Tony to stay here and figure that out so that he can go and make an announcement to the rest of the world to try to keep everyone else calm. And it's from here where we go back to the six civilians, where first we see Tom who's at a bar, listening to Captain America's broadcast. And even though Tom expresses that Captain America is not a bad guy, Deep down inside, he's really agreeing with this other guy at the bar who's saying what everybody else is thinking, which at this point is the question of if everyone is going to have to pay for what the mutants have been up to, which I'm sure is going to change once they hear the truth about the Eternals and the cost of resurrection. And then secondly, we see Katrina, who's been trying to support the heroes and the mutants online through social media. And with doing so, she tweeted a joke earlier after the progenitor's announcement saying, OK, now cancel culture is real, looking for distractions by way of a joke but not a lot of people responded to it and she found herself up all night, sleepless with her anxiety. And then third, we have Komali, who's Arjun's widow, to where for her, she believes that her husband's death was associated with a judgment announcement from the progenitor. And with her husband passing, she just cursed the progenitor, cussed him out, and he just watched. And then fourth, we have Daniela, who's getting messages from her mom telling her to come home because things could get crazy. But Daniela lies to her mom telling her that she's going to come home when instead she just continues to work because if the world doesn't end, her family still needs that money. And then fifth, we have Jada, who's seen the announcement on television. And for Jada, she hears what Captain America is saying and she believes that Captain America is sincere about what he's saying. But she also knows that sincerity and reality 
are rarely close friends. And then from here we have young Kenta, who's really just trying to talk his dad out of having to do homework if the world just might end. And his dad walks away laughing it off, but as soon as his dad walks out the room, that smile goes away. Cause his dad walks out of the room judging himself thinking, what kind of man am I if I can't protect my family? But after this, we then head back over to the exclusion. Sometime after the attack led by Icarus, which may have been an hour or so, we really don't know how long. But it's here where we find that Druig has made his way back to Uranos for advice. And the main reason why is because Druig had sent Jack of Knives to observe the Avengers, and when Druig had seen how bad the judgment had went for Captain America, it made him nervous. Because if Captain America is failing as a leader and a symbol, then what does this mean for Druig as the Prime Eternal? And it's with this thinking and reasoning that Druid makes his way to Uranos to get his advice. And really in the long and short of it, Uranos tells Druid that Captain America failed because he didn't fulfill his duty. And for the Eternals, they're pretty much in the same place. But since there's still time within this 24 hour countdown, Druid can still make amends by continuing to eliminate excess deviation. And any deviation is excess deviation. And hearing this, Druid he agrees. So he makes the announcement to prepare to get the Hex back out and running. And when Uranos hears this, he's like, hey man, if you, you serious, you'd let me out. But in this moment, Druid, he refuses and he tells Uranos that he's not that desperate. And then it's here with Tony, Ajax, and the others, where we find that Tony's come up with a suggestion to just destroy the progenitor by hitting its internal node, which will then just cause the whole thing to fall apart. But immediately Ajax disagrees because this is effectively their god now, and she'd rather a solution where they would work to understand it, rather than just hitting the kill switch. But also Fastos informs Tony, letting him know that the progenitor, it's now pretty much a young celestial. To where for younger celestials in their early days of life, they contain an insane amount of power. So if they go through with Tony's plan and just destroy the progenitor, the damage from that explosion could kill millions which then causes Ajax to just leave the room telling them to find another way because she doesn't want them to risk taking the lives of millions in order to save billions. But as soon as she leaves with Makari, Bastos is then like, hey, if we can find a way to do this safely, we should do it. <laughs> but Bastos lets Tony know that it's gotta be safe and it's gotta be a secret. They gotta do it quiet. And when Sinister hears this, he's like, oh man, I love secrets. <laughs> but then he reaches out to Destiny and he tells her all about Tony's plan. And when we jump back to Krakoa, we find that right away, Destiny's called for the Quiet Council to have a meeting so they can have a vote on what they're gonna do with this new information that they got from Sinister. But also with Druig's attack back in full effect, Charles is killed in his psychic 1v1 with his health bar being substantially lower than Zerus like we'd seen. But with Charles being killed, Emma then calls for Hope to make another Charles. And nonetheless, with him being occupied, this takes him out of the vote on whether they should attack. And with this happening, this effectively puts the ball in the court of the Quiet Council to where now they have to make the decision whether they should kill millions in order to save billions. But it's here where Emma sets up this meeting for the other members, where we find that Destiny has looked into the future to check the risk of this choice, since Sinister had mentioned that the destruction of a celestial will risk devastation. And when Destiny looks into the future, she lets them know that she does not see that devastation. But with the clock ticking, they still have to take a vote. And when this happens, Destiny, Sebastian Shaw, Mystique, Exodus, Hope, they all vote yes. Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Kate Pride, they vote no. And Emma Frost, she abstains, and the motion is passed. But also with this happening, we find out by way of Kate that Storm's no longer in Krakoa because she made her way back to Arako to help the Arakai people to fight off the threats that are left in the wake of Uranus' destruction. But even with the Quiet Council green lighting this plan, they can't really spare anyone leaving Krakoa because if they do, Juig's forces are going to overwhelm them. But then it's here where Emma Frost then lets them know that she'd called in some backup specifically for that. And when she says this, the Krakoan gates open up and deviants walk through. And when they arrive, Crow, he explains to Cyclops that they're able to make their way through Krakoan gates because they share enough similar DNA with the mutants to do so. And with doing this, Crow more or less tells Cyclops that the Deviants stand with their people. And by saying this, Crow's referring to the mutants. <laughs> but then right away, Cyclops, he's like, nah, we're, we're not Deviants, bro. <laughs> but nonetheless, them stepping in here is a huge help and it also allows for Jean and a number of others to make their way to the progenitor. But with them making their way out there, right away Ajax is alerted. And with her being distracted by this for just a few seconds, it gives Sinister the opportunity to make an opening for Jean to give her and the others access to the internal node. And when Sinister gets caught doing this for one, it's just hilarious. But also for him, it's nothing to sacrifice millions to spare billions. And Sinister realizes that killing the progenitor is gonna kill everybody here. And he lets them know if this works and the billions are spared, 
they'll never thank mutants for this. The world's never thanked mutants for saving the day before, and they probably never will, but that's okay. <laughs> but Sinister's like, you guys can thank me later. But <laughs> then he's like, oh yeah, that's right. I'll resurrect and you won't, which is crazy disrespectful. But with this attack on the progenitor effectively going in motion, right away this causes the Eternals to engage within the three principles, to where one of those specifically is to protect the Celestials, which has now made every Eternal here fight against every mutant that's here, who's made their way to destroy the progenitor, including Icarus and the others who we'd seen help the mutants before because regardless of where they stand they're still eternals and their principles override everything but through the course of this exodus takes on icarus giving Jean the space and opportunity to pull off a luke skywalker but with her making her way to attack the internal node tony tries to stop her and warn her of how huge this explosion could be but before he can even finish his sentence Jean strikes the node and tony lets her know that there's a chance that the shock wave of this explosion will take down cities which Jean didn't know because her and Scott left the circle due to moral quibbles, as Destiny would put it. So prior to this with the council making their decision, they had just told Jean what needed to be done instead of giving her the details and all the risks that were involved. But after she strikes the note, Tony takes a look at it, he runs numbers, and he's like, you know what? I think we're gonna be okay. And then the progenitor just explodes, devastating and killing millions within miles. But then just moments after this devastation, Jean then realizes that none of this was real because everyone was in the progenitor's mind this whole time. And this is truly why when Destiny looked into the future and she did not see this destruction, it's only because this whole thing just wasn't real. And for Jean and many of the other heroes, like this is a very humbling moment because right away they realized that they handled this whole situation poorly. But even still with the progenitor not being destroyed, a number of people still died because out of those millions of people seeing their own death happen, you have a number of them who still had a heart attack and it took them out. And from here, the progenitor lets everyone know that the heroes are not above judgment. The clock is still ticking and the individual judgment until then, it continues with Emma Frost getting a thumbs down while Crow gets a thumbs up and Destiny as well as Mystique both get a thumbs down. And aside from this, Jean, she gives Sinister a piece of her mind, but he tells Jean, hey, you would have known had you stayed on the council. And aside from Jean, she's not the only one letting Sinister have it because Ajax is pissed too. And for Sinister, like, I'm not mad at him for thinking this because he's like, hey, now we know what's not gonna work. Kind of implying that the failure is just a learning experience, but at this point, Tony's just like, you know, all we can do is comply because they have no choice now but to be judged. But then it's here where Cap is like, hey, within this time that they have left, what they can do is make sure that they pass by bringing the world together like never before. And it's like, man, Captain America and Uranus out here giving great advice. And like these guys are thinking clutch. But then it's here where we find Cersei in the exclusion with Jack of Knives, who is only helping her for a paycheck. But with her going to the exclusion, she's there to break out someone who she believes can turn this whole thing around, with her hoping that this person can more or less get enough people on the earth to get a thumbs up. And it's here where we find that the person that she is breaking out is Eros, who on one hand, he does have the ability to stimulate the pleasures of someone's mind, which he could use to convince others to do and be better, but his ability is only short range. So I'm curious to see if the Avengers will have him work with the X-Men to have a mutant amplify his power, or if they'll copy his ability to others so that it'll reach either around the globe or at least to a majority of it, because we really only need a majority thumbs up, but we'll see how that plays out soon enough. Alright, so with this one we head back to Earth in New York right in front of the X-Men's treehouse. And at this point, the human protesters, they are turned up. The treehouse is on fire, somebody got a rifle, and they are on edge at this point because on top of their frustrations with mutant resurrection, time's almost up for the countdown to judgment. And for a moment, Captain America is trying to calm everyone down and he's looking into everyone's phone who got their phone pointed at him, telling the world that we're all gonna live. But collectively, the world is just saying, that noise, Captain America, you full of And right away, the protesters, they just serve him that fade. But just after this, we then make our way over to Cersei, who at this point is explaining her plan to Tony, which is to get Eros to connect to the machine in order to get the whole world to be together for just long enough to pass. But as it turns out, Eros, he's not with this plan. Because for him, ever since he was killed in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 5 Issue 6, in an attempt to stop the resurrection of Thanos, we had later discovered his integration with the machine. And from the time of his resurrection up until recently, he was locked away in the exclusion with plenty of time to watch and think. 
and he believes that he has a better idea because if he just connects to the machine and uses his powers, that's likely going to give him an automatic fail, which will then lead to the machine and the rest of the world likely getting the same. And with hearing this, Cersei doesn't want to take the chance because it's literally too much at stake. And since they don't have the time to go back and forth about it, Eros just tells them that they got to get started now. And just after this, we're shown a series of events through the perspective of the progenitor. And we see in these different cases, some get the thumbs up, some get the thumbs down, and others are just observed. And through the course of this, we see Tom again, who got beat up for just looking too Eastern European. But Tom gets the thumbs down for failing to see the irony in all of this. And we've seen a number of occasions for Tom where he would agree with either side and just nod along without having a personal stance on the whole situation. And just after Tom, we then see Mayor Luke Cage, who's asked a question by a member of the press who's really the progenitor in disguise. And with doing this, he asked Mayor Cage, how would you judge your performance? To where then Mayor Cage just deflects, <laughs> saying, ask me tomorrow. And right away, Mayor Cage fails because he deflects like any other political figure would. And after him, the progenitor then goes to Thor, who's way into orbit fighting a member of the Hex. And the progenitor says that the inscription on Thor's hammer says that he's worthy, so he must be. But it's too bad that this doesn't apply to everyone who has ever lifted Mjolnir, which sucks for Cap. But from here, we see the progenitor watching Eros as he moves forward with his plan, which at this point has Eros having a discussion with Sebastian Shaw, which is him opening communication to the mutants. And next, we see the progenitor make an appearance to Kamala Khan in the form of Captain Marvel, while giving Kamala the opportunity to get her family somewhere safe. But Kamala says no, and for that reason, she gets a thumbs up. And after this, next we go to Katrina, who pretty much gets a thumbs down for not leaving a tip. Come on, Katrina, do better. And after this, we then head over to Charles Xavier. And I kind of got mixed feelings about how Charles is judged here. Because the progenitor approaches Charles under the guise that he's actually his son, Legion. And in this moment, while Charles is engaging in psychic warfare with the Eternals, Charles ignores his son who's asking for a moment to talk. And for that reason, he fails. And on one hand, I'm kind of like, you know what? It's kind of the end of the world here. So in that lane, I'd give Charles a pass. But on the other hand, Charles has had many other opportunities to be a better father. And in a way, I believe his judgment is more about that. And next, we go to Kamali, Arjun's widow, who had lost her husband when Sine was resurrected. But in her case, this is more of an observation, as a progenitor appears in her room and then leaves shortly after, in fear of Kamali judging him. And just after this, we then see Eros, who at this point is in Wakanda, but he's been traveling around and talking to different leaders about what those leaders want to talk about. But even more importantly, he listens. And then from here, we see Brandy Selby, the new star brand. She passes from how well she continues to fight. And Daniela from Sao Paulo, she also passes because after lying to her mother and not going home to her, she had then changed her mind to be with her mother in what may be their final hour. And then after this, we got Victor Von Doom which was a judgment that I was hoping to see. In more or less how it plays out, Victor Von Doom passes himself and the progenitor just concurs. And really, I couldn't see that playing out any other way. But moving along, Jada who had lost her child, she gets a thumbs up because she understands the world's frustration and she recognizes that the method of execution with the fighting and the hatred isn't right. And then for Daredevil, the progenitor shows up to him on a cross with a crown full of thorns and a thumbs down. Because for Matt Murdock, his mission as the Daredevil is to keep the streets of Hell's Kitchen from literally becoming Hell. And even with him having his own moral code, Matt Murdock has broken his own code time and time again. And when he receives this judgment, a tear drops below that mask. But then shortly after, he continues with business as usual. And really out of all these judgments, to me, Daredevil's, it kind of hits different. Because for the longest time, he's been the only God can judge me type. And now that that's happened, he's still like, I'ma keep doing it. And it seems very true to his character. And then next we go to Miles Morales who gets a thumbs up from the progenitor who appears to Miles in the form of Peter Parker Spider-Man. And in return, Miles just gives him a thumbs up back. And then the last that we see out of this group is Kenta who still hasn't done his homework, but the progenitor passes on judging him because he's just a child, which really shows us that the children out of the rest of the world, their judgment is pretty much banking on all the adults. And I guess that's a thing for all the children except for Brandy Selby, who practically is still a baby whose age was sped up because she still was judged. So I guess with us seeing this, we're given an example between both Brandy and Kenta that the children are judged according to their circumstance, I guess. 
I don't know. But after this, we then go back to Eros, where we find him speaking to the world leaders, telling them that he's found a solution, which in a nutshell is having the mutants and the Eternals make larger contributions to the world and essentially turn it into a paradise. Because the mutants have offered some of their medicines and their technologies to the world, but they have so much more to offer beyond that. And in the case of the Eternals, recently the world has seen the worst that the Eternals can offer. And Eros intrigues the audience by telling them that if they all come to an agreement, then the world can have access to celestial tech. But with Eros saying this, we gotta point out one thing. Because even though Eros has been added to the machine, he can't speak for all the Eternals. He's not the Prime Eternal. Because as it stands, Druig still holds that spot. And with the way that he's been handling things, it's totally ruining the come together movement. Which from here puts into motion a plan to correct that. But it heavily relies on them catching Druig slipping which in a way is almost guaranteed because nearly every decision we've seen Druig make, it's been either to prove something or just out of fear. And when we head back over to the exclusion, we find Druig on the same thing because as he prepares to bring everyone into the Unimine, including the Hex, for a massive attack, he's doing this in hopes of taking out the mutants while they're at their weakest, but also as a huge show of faith for the progenitor to give him a thumbs up. But of course with Druig not being sure of himself as a leader, he mentions this plan in front of Uranos, almost as if he wants his counsel slash approval again, and more or less Uranos is like, yeah, sounds like a good idea, but you could let me out again and let me handle it. But Druig is like, nope, not that desperate, and he moves forward after getting that passive approval by Uranos. But then it's here where we see Druig release the Unimine, with everyone connected, including the Hex. But then Cersei, Thena, Makari, and Ajax, they come and they merge with the Unimine as well. And initially, Druig, he believes that this is Cersei and the others switching from the losing team and joining with him. But then it's here where we find out that the sabotage mission of Icarus and Gilgamesh, it isn't over yet. Because deep inside the machine, they've taken down the firewalls and they allow the mutants to join the Unimine, which is nuts. And remember, the Unimine is more than just a weapon. Because first and foremost, it's the Eternal's democracy. And right away they put that to use by calling for an election for the new Prime Eternal. And the X-Men waste no time by voting for Eros. And right away Druig recognizes that he's going to lose. Because numbers wise, the mutants clearly have the majority vote. And Druig has to act quick and do something before he loses his position as Eternal Prime. And initially Druig tries to counter what's been done because we've seen him rig an election before, back when Thanos became the Prime Eternal. But in this moment for Druig, he doesn't have the time to swing the election back in his favor. And with just seconds left, Uranos, he's telling Druig like, you know, you could just let me out. And he tells Druig like, you gotta let me out, do it now. I'm your only chance. And with Uranos saying this, Druig folds and he lets Uranos out in hopes that Uranos could stop them with Druig only having seconds left. But Uranos tells Druig that he doesn't plan to help him because he was such a poor leader. But effectively this plan works and it makes Eros the new Prime Eternal, which means that he can now make good on his plans of bringing the world together. But with Druig now out of the way, the new issue is Uranos, who at this point has unleashed his armory on Earth. And really now I think is a good time, better than any, to talk about what Uranos really wants to do. Because his intentions were made clear as day in the Eternals The Heretic issue 1 by Kieran Gillen. Because it was here where we were shown the perspective of Uranos in relation to the three principles. Because when it came to excess deviation, he of course wanted to get rid of all deviants. Secondly, when it came to protecting the machine, he sees the machine for what it is, the infrastructure of the planet and the Eternals, nothing else. And all existence outside of the machine is a possible threat to the machine. And since the deviant is not the machine, the flower is not the machine, the mammal is not the machine, all can and should be purged. And for Uranos, after the world is secured, the galaxy is next. And in the case of the third principle, protect celestials. In their case, he just believes that they're the ones that need to be locked up. Because a god is too precious to be free. A god should be safely in a cage. So in this moment with us seeing Uranos free in his armories, letting off all sorts of attacks across the world, from his perspective, this is him just getting started. And with seeing this chaos break out, that's why in this moment, Drew is kind of like, I messed up. But through the course of this, Iron Man makes his way to Araco, and he tells Storm and Magneto that Uranos is about to do to Earth what he did to Araco, so he needs them to step in. And he lets them know that they're able to use some of the old portals that Uranos had created. If they apply a huge electromagnetic charge, they can use them to get back to Earth. And so like we had seen when the Hour of Magneto began, it's no issue for Storm and Magneto to produce that electromagnetic charge to hijack one of the old armory portals. And as soon as they get here, they hit Uranos. 
with the same attack that we'd seen them hit the plastic gorilla with in X-Men Red issue 6. But of course, Uranos, he just takes it. But by no means did they intend for this attack to deal heavy damage on Uranos. But instead, they had just used it to buy time so that Tony could hack the other portals and redirect the armory's attacks to all point back at him. And even this didn't kill Uranos. It more or less just had him looking like Daffy Duck with his beak shot off. But as a result of his excessive damage, he had began a process of telekinetically reassembling himself, which had given them the opportunity to place Uranos back in his cell. But at this point for Magneto, he's given all that he's had. And in a brief moment where he could have called for help, instead he accepts this ending for himself because he could have had Storm sustain him a bit longer just to make it to the healing gardens. But instead he chooses for this to be the end of the road for him. But in a brief moment just before Magneto passes, the progenitor appears to him in the form of his daughter Anya and Magneto gets the thumbs up. And just after this, we finally get the answer to the progenitor's judgment on Icarus and Circe where Icarus gets the thumbs up and Cersei gets the thumbs down, which then has Tony like how? How did Cersei get the thumbs down when she came up with a plan that potentially saved everyone? But with Cersei getting this judgment, she doesn't even try to make sense of it because she knows out of her long life that there are a number of things that she's done that could have gotten her that thumbs down. But from here, Eros, as the new Prime Eternal, he takes to the podium to speak to the progenitor because now as Prime Eternal, he has the means to make good on the plans that he has to bring the world together. And Eros tells the progenitor that much like everyone else, he spent years wasting his potential. But within this past 24 hours, they've made plans for peace and for a better future for everyone. But for the world to truly change, it's not going to all happen in a day. And the fact is, the world truly isn't out of time unless the progenitor says they are. So more or less, Eros tells the progenitor like, well, what do you say? Give us time and give us the opportunity to do and be better. But the progenitor, he responds and he tells them that if they had more time, if they had a million years, they will still not have done enough. Because the people of this world are always like, tomorrow we'll do better, tomorrow we'll be better. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And he tells them that they've never put into consideration that those tomorrows may run out. And it's here where the progenitor lets them know that that day, the day that tomorrows run out, it's today. As he gives his judgment and the world gets the thumbs down. And it's from here where the global death sentencing begins as the progenitor makes his way to take this world out. All right, so at this point, we are coming in hot from the progenitor giving its judgment and giving the entire world a big thumbs down. And even after what I would say was a very reasonable solution that was presented by Eros, with them not only suggesting that the world could work together, but providing a tangible start alongside of that proposal. But of course, like any start, it would take time for this to develop. And the progenitors like, nope, man, give me no more time as it continues to judge the world as it is, which on one hand, I get it because we've seen a number of times over that it's impossible to get billions of people on the same page. And it almost reminds me of a quote that I heard in an old movie. And I'm sure one of you guys will pick it up and, and tell me in the comments where it came from. But I remember hearing someone say somewhere that the world would never come together unless there was like an alien invasion. And in a lot of cases, the only chance that people would come together is if they had to. And though that saying it isn't one to one with this whole event, but there's a lot of moments in this event that remind me of that. And hopefully one of you guys can tell me in the comments where that quote came from, because I know I didn't make it up. But at this point, after the progenitor has given his judgment to the world and with doing so deciding that the whole world has failed, from here forward, judgment is over and the sentencing begins. But with how this goes down, we do take a moment again and travel to different parts of the world. And we check back in on the different faces we've been seeing throughout the series after judgment has been given. And through the course of this, we see Tom from London, who at this point, after judgment, his son has taken a deep breath and he's decided to tell his father all about who he is. And it's like, man, Tom can't get a break. And next, we see Katrina from Vancouver, who you may remember as the girl who didn't leave a tip. But in her case, she's not focused on the fact that she failed or even why because that doesn't even matter now but instead she's taking the time to rush to the burning streets to help those in need because like we've seen in issue two she means well but now it's like we've seen that she's learned that it's more about what you can do to help who you can and just after her we go to Kamali the widowed wife of Arjun and we see for her that she just waits and next we head over to Daniela who like we'd seen she had dropped everything that she was doing to be with her mother and her mother just struggles to figure out why everyone else hasn't done the same and why many people are rioting and looting when the world's about to end and those people may never get to use the things that they've taken. But amongst these different people, we also come across young Kenta from Yokohama. And the progenitor recognizes that young Kenta is scared and the progenitor is sorry about that. But even after giving this judgment, the progenitor says, the adults built a world for Kenta to live in. They built a world for him to die in too. 
and it's kind of like, man, I get it, but it's cold blooded. But also amongst these people, we come across Jada, who like we'd seen before, she'd lost her daughter and the progenitor had acknowledged that her view of the world and understanding that people were upset but going about it wrong, that she essentially was right. And on the other hand, with Captain America hoping that people could be better, he was wrong. And right now, in this very moment, Jada wishes that she was wrong. But she takes a moment to grab Cap some coffee, which on one hand has me thinking, you know, shout out to the coffee shop that's open on Judgment Day. But when this happens, it gives us a pretty cool moment with the conversation between the two of them. Because we see a bit of the vulnerability from Cap when he expresses that he actually thought that he could inspire people to make a difference. Though on the other hand with Jada, she knew the world was going to fail, but she appreciates Cap trying. But it's here in this conversation where Cap asks Jada if she has any family because she should probably be with them at a time like this. And she tells Cap more about herself, how she had lost her daughter, and ever since then she had just hated other people for existing. And in response, Cap tells her that it's not too late, she can still get out there. And right then she cuts off Cap and tells him he's doing it again, the whole inspiration thing and he's kind of like yeah I guess he is bad habit and she lets him know more or less that it's not a bad habit but it's just a good habit in a bad world and it's here where Nightcrawler shows up and he tells Cap that everyone thinks that he should give this false god a piece of his mind so Cap thanks Jada for the talk and he heads off with Nightcrawler who bounce teleports Cap numerous times all the way to the North Pole and with how this is done Nightcrawler tells Captain America that Professor X is linking this moment to everyone in the world so everyone's gonna see and hear this speech so Nightcrawler more or less tells Cap, make it good. And in this moment, Captain America, he stands up to the progenitor and he tells him that he stood up to tyrants before who were sure that it was all over. And they were just as sure as the progenitor is. And Cap says that he was there in 1940 when the people thought it was over. And his hero says that heroism isn't about strength, it's about not giving in. And Cap says that it's not over as long as any of us are standing. And then it's here where he tells the world, knowing that they're listening, that we're all Avengers now, assemble and avenge. And as soon as he says that, the progenitor then eviscerates him and Nightcrawler, but with doing so, unintentionally making a martyr out of Captain America. But just moments after this, we then head back over to Kokoa, where of course Nightcrawler has to be filled back in about how exactly it went down. And it's here we start to see that there's a bit of intention behind this plan, because Jean tells him that the world got just what it needed, and their anger is now directed at the progenitor, which hints towards this being done intentionally, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. But also in this moment where Nightcrawler comes back, we also have like Wolverine checking on him, and I like how Karen Gillan kind of just throws this in, because I've always appreciated the friendship or brotherhood between Nightcrawler and Wolverine where usually we see this thing where Wolverine he respects Nightcrawler's religious beliefs and I feel like that's kind of being played upon right here with Nightcrawler saying that he rejects this god or better yet he rejects this parody of a god and I'm glad that we got this moment because to me Nightcrawler and Wolverine have always been like brothers where Wolverine is more physically and tougher and more protective of Nightcrawler but on the flip side Kurt is more emotionally protective of Logan and I love it when we get those moments between the two of them. But then it's here where we go over to the Grove in Kokoa, which is where we usually have the Quiet Council meet. But at this point in time, everyone's here. And Xavier lets them know that after Captain America's speech at the North Pole, that he's gotten messages and support from leaders around the world who are ready to lend their forces to whatever plans the heroes have moving forward. And I'm sure that's also partially because of the work that heroes had done traveling around and talking to leaders as well. But with the world leaders expressing that they're ready to deploy their military forces and stand behind whatever plan the heroes have, the heroes still got to come up with the details of the rest of the plan and it's from here where Cyclops proposes that they go for the node like we'd seen in issue 3 but this time evacuate the people from around who would have been casualties and initially Tony's against it because he thinks it's a trick but Gene lets Tony know that it was real and that's why they fell for it but from here with them setting out for the same target essentially they approach it differently because the Eternals can't directly attack a Celestial not without their principles kicking in but now since their psychic firewalls have been taken down they could have another telepath control them and make them attack the Celestial. And not just Cersei and Icarus, but they could control the Hex as well. And when taking this route, Magic asks Destiny, okay, we do this, what are the chances? And Destiny says this is their only way, but modifications have to be made. And it's from here when we see what seems to be everybody heading to the North Pole. And amongst those heading out here, you have Avengers, X-Men, the Inhumans, and in the case of the Inhumans, they're being controlled by Jean Grey. But also in addition to this, you got military forces showing up from all around the world. And for the most part, this first wave is just military, followed by some of your smash and slash heroes until the Hex come in. Because the Hex was designed to protect the Celestial from something that could kill a Celestial. And just after the Hex, the next wave of heavy hitters come in. 
with Captain Marvel, the Phoenix, Exodus, Icarus, Jean, and Namor, who then come in and stagger the progenitor, which is then followed by Thor, who brings the hammer down. But then it's in this moment where we find out from the progenitor that it had been holding back this whole time. And it's from here where it just gets nasty. Thor gets wasted, Exodus, Jean, Echo, all of them are just one shot. The Stepfords are just fried and just about everyone else at the North Pole is killed in a number of different ways with the progenitor attempting to be creative about it, which is also pretty messed up. But fortunately, Tony ends up hauling it and making it out of there alive, barely. And globally, the destruction is nuts, with cities burning, the water turning to fire, and a group of rich people try to make an escape. And we're told that the people on this shuttle, they have more wealth than the people on Earth left behind combined. But the progenitor sees them and refuses to let them escape judgment. And from here moving forward, it gets absurd because next we see Krakoa just going up in flames with the progenitor saying no more mutants to suffer in a world of hatred and fear. Only your God is immortal. The earth is not. To where from there we see Mystique and Destiny holding each other, going up in flames, Cyclops in the background not feeling so good. It's just all bad. And with the progenitor destroying the earth, the earth puts up a fight. But the progenitor is set on thrashing this world into obedience, which in this case is death. But then it's here where we find what Destiny was talking about earlier when she said that their plan to attack the progenitor needed modifications. Because with them leaving certain people there, the progenitor would think that everybody had showed up, which for the most part was like your heavy hitters, RIP to all of them. But this is what takes us into the next phase of the plan, with the last one being the hammer approach and this one being more the scalpel. Because now they got their scientists and their psychics sitting back waiting as they then bring in Jack of Knives to head back to the North Pole with a team so they can sneak in undetected. But but of course, they do get detected, and Jack of Knives figures that if this is his last mission, one, he doesn't want it to be a failure, and two, he wants to make sure he goes out with a bang. And he does exactly that, as he buys him time, and seconds later he's just eviscerated. But it's here we find that back with the others, on the other side of this plan, they have a limited number of eggs, so they gotta be very selective about who they bring back. And when the selection is made, Exodus disagrees, and by all means he's of rank and he could stop this, cause he says who they're about to bring back, it goes against everything, all the rules of Kokoa. And in this final moment, Nightcrawler says Cyclops is a great leader, but he's not who the Earth needs right now. And as soon as he says that, Captain America's shield just busts out of this egg because they've resurrected Captain America by way of the five, which was supposed to be exclusive to mutants. And as a side note, this reveal kind of leaves me with a bunch of questions. First and foremost got me like, okay, you just go come out the egg with the shield, huh? Like what's more American than that? But from here, we just got to stick around and see where it goes. But what we do know at this point is that everybody is sharing everything and everyone's working together. We just got to wait and see if it's enough. Alright, so at this point we jump back in with the progenitor being in full execution mode after the world had collectively failed Judgment Day. But then it's here where we see one of the Eternals transport nodes open up with a very much alive and not too long ago resurrected Captain America, who at this point makes his way back to Jada, his coffee buddy from issue 5, and it's here where he reaches for her hand and brings her through the transport node where we find that the Eternals had opened up their cities as shelters for the people of the world so that while the heroes are trying to figure this out, these people will at least have a place to stay. And this is one of those things that spun out from the Star Fox AX tie-in where we had seen that aside from his contributions on the political side he had been trying to help as many people as he could but really running around and trying to help every single individual though it's a commendable effort it's really not a feasible way to save the world and for Star Fox who in this event he's effectively a part of every side eternal slash prime eternal check <laughs> and double check but on top of that he's effectively a mutant of his own race so really he checks all the boxes but with him providing the people around the world a place of safety until all this is sorted out this is something that was greatly appreciated because everyone didn't make it to the arc so to speak like Tom who made his family stay only to find out soon after that that was a mistake and then we have Katrina who had made her way back through the portal multiple times in an attempt to help others get through but in her last trip she never made it back and then just after this we see Daniela who just before entering her portal she struggled with the thought of whether she should go back for her bike which is something that I think was a nice touch because on one hand yeah the world's ending but to see Daniela struggle with the idea of going back for her means of transportation which is effectively how she feeds her family like I could see that struggle making sense 
But it's also here where we see Jada run into Kenta, who at this point we come to find out that he had lost both of his parents before he got here. But with seeing these different situations, they're just examples of the hardships that many have went through to get here as well as the number of people that didn't make it. But for those that are here, they're very grateful to Eros for him providing them shelter while the heroes sort this out. And it's here where we follow Eros where he meets with Nightcrawler that we find out with Vastos successfully resetting the machine. Kurt believes that this has bought them anywhere from 12 hours to a whole nother day. But when Captain America shows up, he lets them know that it's not likely this will happen because they haven't considered the idea of the progenitor changing its tactics. And we quickly come to find out that that's exactly what it's doing. Because after all, this thing has inherited a lot from Tony Stark. Because when they used Tony's nervous system to build this thing, that was a red flag in itself. But it's here we go back to the progenitor where we find that he's going for world destruction the manual way. Because at this point, he's now making his way to the reality loom that lies at the edge of the machine so that this way he can simply just make the world explode. Which now lets Eros and the others know that they have way less time than they thought. But at this point inside of the progenitor, the team that we would saw go in, they've been through quite a bit themselves. With Tony being judged not long after they'd entered, to where in his case, he passed. But on the other hand, with Jean Grey being judged, with the sins of the Dark Phoenix weighing heavily on the progenitor's decision, Jean failed. But this later then led to us discovering through Makari, Ajax, and Cersei that along their way throughout the chambers of the progenitor, while battling its immune system and making their way to its core, the progenitor had updated and resealed the Eternals' telepathic firewalls, meaning that moving forward, they can no longer be controlled by Jean. But on top of this, they were also free to act however they wish, which I'm guessing that Cersei had seen in the latest patch notes of the Eternals' firmware update. But with the group making their way into the core, with the progenitor completely unaware. It's here where they now find that the progenitor is in the process of destroying the world the manual way. So in response, Jean quickly goes for the Betsy Braddock Psylocke maneuver with a splash of Wolverine as she goes for the sneak attack. But before Jean could connect, she's attacked by Ajax, who once again is not forced to do this by the progenitor, but instead she's doing this because she believes that there's another way. Because if Jean strikes here and now, her and the other mutants will be resurrected, but humanity would die. And it's at this point where we find that the progenitor is just outside the Eternal City, which is a short distance to the reality loom, which once again would have made Jean's attack super dangerous to humanity with the great number of human refugees that are packed inside. But then also with this being the case, Eros called for the armies of Uranos to open up so that every person who was ready and willing could do what they could to hold off the progenitor. And this is something that was followed shortly after by Captain America giving the progenitor a warning, because you know what happened last time. <laughs> which then caused the progenitor to be like, you want some more of this old man? But of course with Cap doing this and even all the people being armed and shooting at the progenitor, this was all really just to buy time and distract the progenitor just in time for Sign to attack, with Sign being half made and fresh off of the broken resurrection engines. But with Exodus giving her a power boost with the help of the other telepaths, this gives Sign enough juice to bring the progenitor to one knee. But even still with all of this support, Sign isn't able to hold up for long because she's literally not built for this much power and soon after, this causes her to burn out. But at this point, with their quote unquote big gun being down, out of the blue, Orcus then comes through with the assist, which really is not much of a shocker, because it's not like they're trying to save the mutants, or the Eternals for that matter, but it's more like they've come down to having a common enemy. But at this point, with all the attacks that have been happening on the outside, they have effectively been buying time for Jean and the others on the inside, with every attack mattering because every second counts. Which from here leads to Jean and Sinister going back for the sure shot of killing the progenitor to save who they can instead of losing everyone. But it doesn't work, she spotted, and it's here where the progenitor lets them know that yeah, he thought about it, but they still deserve to die. Because even with the recent events being another test of sorts, they failed. Because even still, their actions have been in self-interest. And in addition, with the Eternals being free, that liberty has led to no change. And with the progenitor saying this, Cersei, she's like, okay, you know what? Bump it. And with the snap of a finger, she broadcasts herself to everyone. And she spills the tea on the Eternals' resurrection. And she lets the world know, like, y'all yeah, know how Eternals be dying and coming back, right? So now the way it works is every time an Eternal dies, it kills a human to resurrect us. And when Cersei says this, you can see the reaction all over the place. There's shock, there's anger, there's confusion, and Captain America even asks Eros if it's true. And Eros tells Cap, it's all facts, on God. And in this moment, the progenitor, he listens to the people's anger. He cuts off Cersei before she finishes. And in the wave of a hand, he hits her with that God splash, 
making Cersei the first Eternal to be dead dead. But just after this, with the Progenitor proceeding to put the Earth into self-destruction mode, Ajax questions if the Progenitor even deserves to make this call. And also on the inside, the Progenitor is told by Jean that she'd failed because she destroyed the world when she wasn't in control. But unlike her in this moment right now, the progenitor is doing this intentionally with a cold heart, which instantly causes hesitation from the progenitor. But even now he hesitates to stop because even if he does, less than a billion will survive. But this then causes Tony to step in and tell the progenitor that the whole my bad expression just isn't enough. And with him passing Tony prior to this, Tony understands that this was done because in a messed up way, they're kind of two in the same. And he expresses to the progenitor that he gets out of his depths by making amends. And the progenitor could do the same by not doing this. But with the responding and telling Tony that this will destroy him, Tony just lets him know that that comes with the job of being a hero. And so with hearing all this, the progenitor stops the end of the world knowing that it'll destroy him. But with doing this, he then begins to set everything back how it was. But in the process, he turns to Ajax, who's one of his makers. And he asks her, is he a worthy god? And it's here where Ajax says no, and she gives him the thumbs down. And with seeing this, the progenitor acknowledges that she's correct. And as he finishes putting back everything how it was, in his last words, he tells her to be better. And then it's right here, just like that. Everything goes back to how it was. The progenitor goes back to being Avengers Mountain. All the destruction is undone. Everyone's sent back to their homes. And those who the progenitor had killed directly through judgment, their lives are restored as well which as a result, this brings back Tom and his family. But as far as Kamali's husband, Arjun, he's still gone at the cost of resurrecting Sign. But in addition to this, everyone else, Katrina, everyone in the world, they all remember the events that had taken place. So for cases like Daniela, who's usually hard at work, when her mom calls her, she responds quicker and she takes the time to see her every chance she gets. Then also Jada, she gets a text from Captain America who wants to meet up and have some coffee. And Kenta, who's just right away back with his family, he just goes back to being a kid. And his parents don't bother to tell him that they had actually died because they're back now, so why bother? But also with the progenitor resetting the world and undoing the damage that he had caused, it's here we find that he had upgraded Ajax to Ajax Celestia, who is still the old Ajax in part, but now she's the Eternal's new god, with Cersei's death being a permanent one, which had made her the martyr for the new church. And also aside from this, we find that Eros has made a deal with Zerus, which consisted of him publicly apologizing on behalf of the Eternals to the mutants so that in return, Eros would make Zerus the prime Eternal again. And this public apology came with a pretty crazy addition of the Eternals giving the people of Arako the ability to use Uranos for one hour at their own discretion, which is pretty nuts. And I'm looking forward to the moment where the Arakai people pull this card out of their pocket. But in addition to this, we also find out what happened with Druig. Because as it turns out, he's a cellmate with Uranos, who from the looks of things is going to be taking his cornbread for the next thousand years or so. It's kind of messed up. But after this, we then come to find out that Jean is going to be sharing the resurrection program with the world. But she's doing so with an independent program that is separate from Kokoa called the Phoenix Foundation, which is actually a pretty perfect name. But her foundation will only utilize 5% of the five's workload and it'll prioritize the vulnerable, the weak, the poor, and those whom the world has abandoned, as well as having children be first in line. But aside from this, we go on to see that Ajax Celestia is moving forward to do her best to be worthy of her title so that she doesn't make the same mistake as her predecessor because everyone can't be judged in one day, or at least they shouldn't be because everyone should realize that any day humanity could go too far. And for that reason, every day is judgment day. But also now with everything kind of going back to normal, I think it's time that we start getting back to some of our other talks on Avengers as far as Death Hunters and Avengers Forever since Judgment Day is soon coming to a close. And for a while we kind of left those stories hanging. So look out for more of that coming soon. And so now real quick, I'm gonna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so we can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.